that we're all very completely individualized and you've done that on purpose. <laughs> I thank you, Lord, that um, you love us and you want us to love you and to love one another. So, God, we just submit our spirit, souls, and bodies to the Lordship of Christ, yes. to the leading of Holy Spirit alone, and to the Father. We submit ourselves mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, intellectually, to the Lordship of Christ, to the leading of Holy Spirit, to the benefits of the cross, to the benefits of resurrection, to everything that is ours through co-heirship, through the forgiveness that we have already, we already have. God, we want that. Yes. We desire to walk into the free, walk in the freedom of the full forgiveness. And so, God, I just pray you give us all ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to comprehend what it is you're saying in the midst of all of this. And I just bless every woman here. I bless every person that might be listening. I encourage you to. Um, to be open to hear Holy Spirit talk to you. I bind up all condemnation that would uh, seek to kill, steal, and destroy and to speak. Ooh. And I just release that from this place and throw it out. Yes. And we just receive the kindness of God that speaks the truth in love to us. That refuses to allow us to remain the same. Because God's the smartest person that I know. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so uh, today's topic is on self-hatred and um, self-sabotage, which I have been extremely guilty of. My background's a little bit complicated. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. I had a family who had been very unloved and did not know how to love. and Because they didn't know how to love one another, and they didn't know how to receive love, they didn't know how to love me. And so you move forward in life, and you wonder why you don't like yourself. But if you look back in life, you realize nobody liked themselves either. <laughs> and you were around that neighborhood. That, that, well, it is a neighborhood. Your family is a neighborhood. <laughs> and so you, you wonder. And so we were deprived of affection. We were de deprived of um, health. We were deprived, we were de deprived financially of some things. Of course, my dad could have a thousand shoes. Yes. But we might have a couple. Now, he's passed on a long time ago. None of this is to dishonor, but I'm just going to bring it out there. Yeah. He's dancing with God now. He's up there doing whatever it is they do. And so he's like, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. And so <laughs> he gets it. And so uh, Dad was the harsh, unbending, my way or the highway. Get the hell out of my way. It's my way. My mom was whatever you say because... She was so filled with a lack of entitlement, and she was so came from such a deprived environment that she did not have any clue <clears throat> how to be a person. She was controlled by him under his thumb. There should be a song called Under His Thumb, you know? And so we, we, lived, we lived in that environment, and we didn't know any other way to be, so we became my way or the highway. We became... Let me criticize you before you have a chance to criticize me. Wow. We became, let me reject you before you have a chance to reject me. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. We became those people that we did not like. And as a family, we lived in torment. And we lived in fear all the time. And so I've been in a long process of healing. Um, I was anorexic for 20-something years, years ago. My family uh, <clears throat> went obese, and I went anorexic. And so... Our family <laughs> had a lot of issues. And so I just want to say before I move forward that I have some family members here. And uh, I already have permission to just really lay it out there. My family is completely different than what I grew up in. We have all come to know, the, for the most part, come to know the Lord and, uh, in this room. And so I'm just going to share some truth things. <clears throat> and so I, I asked permission because I didn't want anybody hurt. I love my sisters, uh, but yes. my sisters were not kind to me. My sisters uh, hated my guts. My sisters wanted me to die before I ever came out of the womb. My sisters did not want my life to exist. And so uh, my mom didn't do anything about that. 
So my mom didn't know how to respond to that because my mom had worthlessness all in her and all over her. She had a lack of entitlement. She was poverty driven, poverty stricken. She was literally born in a poor house. And at that time, it was worse than an orphanage. It was worse than our homeless shelters. A poor house was unhealthy. It had no hygiene. It probably maybe not even had running water. We're talking a poor house. She was born in a poor house. So she grew up with no respect for herself. She did not eat meat until she was nine years old. They lived in a tent next to the river. I'm just painting a picture for some things that we grew up under this kind of parenting. We grew up with a dad who, when he left, when he was a kid, to go get food, he, they shot their food. He took three bullets. If he came back without three bullets or without three pieces of food, he got very harshly punished. So if he brought back two bullets, or one bullet and one piece of food, a lacked a bullet he missed, he was, he was tormented, okay? Because they were in depression. They were in poverty-stricken times. And so I understand that, but we grew up in that kind of environment where you were basically worthless. And so it was very difficult. We didn't understand that. We didn't know. Um, we had a lot of things happen when we were kids that were very unkind, that set the pace for us to have no worth, to hate ourselves religiously and rigidly. Uh, I personally grew up with a lack of entitlement. I felt like I deserved nothing. So if you abused me, that was okay. Now, this is a part of self-respect. If, if I allowed people to abuse me, and I allowed them to abuse me because I loved them so much, I just kept thinking, you know what, but they'll change one day. I kept thinking, maybe tomorrow they'll love me instead of hit me. I kept thinking, well, what, what if I wake up and it's different? I had such expectancy and such hope for my environment to change, and, and I walked with complete and unconditional love for my family, even though they didn't know how to love me back. And so... Growing up like that, having a lack of entitlement, let me tell y'all, sister friends, that is just as bad as having an entitlement where I deserve this and I deserve that and I want this and I want that. Because let me tell you what lack of entitlement did. For me, it stopped me from setting goals for myself. It stopped me from accomplishing things. It began a cycle of self-sabotage like nobody's business because I didn't deserve to finish anything. I didn't deserve to get that blue ribbon to run the race. I didn't deserve to be first place. Oh, I, didn't deserve, I, I did not get in the choir on purpose because I thought it cost money, and I was too afraid to ask, so I didn't ask. My senior year, I finally asked about it, and it never cost money. So all those years, when I could have been in choir, cultivating uh, singing, which I love to sing, cultivating the gift of singing and, and training and all the things that comes with that kind of thing, I never did it because I thought it cost money, because I didn't deserve that because I didn't want my parents to spend the money because I didn't think they had the money. Hello? <laughs> and so it was a vicious cycle. And so there were a lot of things I never asked for and never did on purpose just because I didn't deserve it. And so um, that set me up for self-sabotage. Uh, not setting goals was huge. And if I did set a goal, I didn't finish it. If I set a goal to do something, it was very rare that I finished it. Um, it was very difficult to finish things. And this is one of the things my mom did for you moms. Listen, help your kids press through. Don't sympathize with their sicknesses. Oh, you just take a nap. No, get your butt up. You'll be all right. Give them some water. I'm just saying, I know people really get sick, so don't Facebook me probably and say, you're such a ITCH. Don't do that. I'm just telling you, for me... I grew up with, if I didn't feel good, my mom was like, oh, that's okay, honey. You can do it tomorrow. It was always, you could do it tomorrow. You know, it's okay. If I got stressed, I went and took a bath. I didn't even do my homework sometimes. Now, listen, that didn't hurt me, but don't let your kids do this. <laughs> my, my mom wrote my poems for me. I didn't ever have to finish those things. Listen, some of this might be, <laughs> I'm just telling you, I'm telling you, some of the things that happened to us in time set us up in our life for things that were never for us. Never for us. And we can change. 
And, and it takes more than your will, though. I used to be the, just submit to the Lord and repent. Just repent. Well, you know what? That was rude and unkind. And I ask you to forgive me for those of you in this room that I told that to 20 years ago. <laughs> and I'm sure I did. Because it isn't that simple. You really, we really truly need a we need a revelation that God is real. We need a revelation that God loves us. We need the revelation. You have to have the revelation. If condemnation flows through you, it's because it lives inside you. You may think you have no condemnation, but if you're critical with your your mind, your mouth, mm. you've got condemnation living inside of you. Mm. And I'm, I'm cognizant that Christ lives in us, and therefore there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation. But if it flows through you. Then it's, then it's operating in you. Mm -hmm. And you need to come face to face with that and take the time. Take the time to look at that and come out of agreement with it so that you can be healed. So you can go through the process of healing. And maybe for you to be a one-stop shop on the cross and you can see yourself and you can be free from a bunch of junk. I totally advocate that. I've had some freedom in that way. But then there's been some things I've had to wait on. Some things I've had to process. Some things I've had to confront. Mm -hmm. Some things I've had to, you know, I remember going to the fellowship hall as a brand new believer and walking in and, and <laughs> walking in and looking into the room and going, I hate these people. <laughs> and God spoke to me and said, how, how can you serve me Not if you don't hate, if you hate my people? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh God, so I ran to the bathroom and I just wept and wept and wept. I'm like, oh God, I don't know how. I don't know how to love it, but if you'll show me how, I'll learn how to love. That was my response, you know. And then it was very soon after that I met Bethany Martin, if y'all know Bethany. And she might have even been in there. I don't, I don't remember because we were all single at the time. And uh, I didn't have any friends. I left all my friends. I had no friends. None. Not one. And I, I asked her, I said, would you be my friend? And she's like, I'll be your friend. You know, I wasn't an easy person to be a friend with. But uh, we're still friends 25 years later, you know, because she, she chose to be my friend, you know. So y you have to choose some things. You have to choose some things. You have to choose to see that you have an issue instead of avoiding it at all costs. Because it's very difficult to be free from something that you don't have the willingness to look at. You might be busy pointing your finger at other people who have the same issue you have. You know that whole thing, one finger, three fingers back? It's so true. It's so true when you point the finger. And then sometimes, you know, the word, what, it doesn't the word say, uh, before you take a telephone pole out of somebody else's eyes, take it out of yourself? But you can take the telephone pole out and then point it out to somebody else, too. It isn't always that somebody's criticizing you from a place of criticism, either. Sometimes they are free. Sometimes they really are. And if you're like, what are you, what are you criticizing me for? Mm -hmm. That shows you where you're at. <laughs> you feel like you're condemned. If you feel like you're condemned, then you got condemnation living in you and through you, and you need to get free from that, regardless of what somebody says to you. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Am I hurting anybody here? <laughs> Give me time. Anyway, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I love. I'm just messing. And so let me. I I, I want to see. Oh, it's all level at the foot of the cross. And uh, Darren, our, our pastor, says, uh, you can't live differently than you believe. And when I started hearing him say that a few years ago, I was like, what does that mean? You can't live differently than you believe. And so, you know, they have, uh, the church where we go to has really challenged me. I'm sure it's challenged Craig too, but really challenged me because when, when we first came, I was all wrapped up in proving that I was important. <laughs> and I was wrapped up in proving that I was significant because I was so, I felt so uncared for. And I felt so insignificant. Mm -hmm. And I felt, I felt like, um, but I have all this to offer. And, and their whole gig was, we don't care what you got to offer. We just like you. <laughs> but if you're busy, if you find that you have to prove that you have value through what you do, then what is it Darren says? Then you don't know who you are. Oh, again. You know, it's like, 
If he said it once, he said it a thousand times. And sometimes I just wanted to slap him, but you don't slap pastors. But you know, sometimes I'm just so mad. I'm like, come on, you keep talking to me, leave me alone. But yet, and that's what he was doing. He was trying to release us from the religion. Yes. See, that's religion. Yes, it is. You know, that's legalism. And that's what self hatred is right. it's legalism. Mm. You legally bind yourself mm. in not liking you. Because you have this wrong, and this wrong, and this wrong, and you did this wrong, and you did this wrong, and you did that wrong, or they did that to you, and they did that to you, and they did that to you, when none of that matters, because all of that was on the cross. All of that was on the cross. I told somebody the other day, I said, you know, it's all about the cross. They're like, it's not all about the cross. I'm like, well, it really is all about the cross. I said, what about your testimony? I said, but my testimony is all about the cross, because if you can't forgive you, you cannot forgive anybody else. It is impossible to forgive anybody unless you forgive you. And if you are criticizing and you are condemning other people or yourself, it's because you have not forgiven yourself. It is that simple. I wish it were more complicated. And if your children are critical and your children are condemning or your children don't like themselves, it's probably because you have poured that down their throat. But you can rectify it by you changing. You cannot point the finger at them and say, you need to like yourself. That's not going to help them like themselves. It's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. They get to watch you transform, and as you transform, they will transform. Yes. Because they will receive the love. Because if you start loving you, you'll start loving them more. And all of a sudden, you'll have this exchange scene when your kid will like you. Like, oh my gosh, what's happening? My kid's loving me now. Ah! It'll be like, um, oh. it'll be wonderful. You know, so because we're all making, it's a process. It's a process. And listen, I, I asked her if I could do this. When uh, we got married, I married a family. You know, when you get married, you don't marry one person. You marry their entire family. Yeah, that's, right. that's how it works in real time. Whether you like it or not, that's how it works. So you need to look carefully before you marry because you got a lot of stuff, junk you're marrying. It's not just your junk. You're marrying junk, and junk it gets to create more junk. So anyway, we got we got married, and um, I was really a bitch. I'm just telling you, I had no respect for myself, and because I had no respect for myself, I had no respect for anybody else, including Craig, including the kids, because I didn't know how. I just didn't know how. We're moving into six. Uh, we're going on our 16th year, and I honestly just didn't know how. And it didn't look like that because, you know, we were at church all the time. We're all holy and the there, down, and all that. We got a long ways. That's okay. I don't care. I don't care. Bring it open. Open it all. Open it all. Um, I don't care. You already started to do it. And so we, I was just really a bitch. And I know the people watching that if you're super religious and you don't like me saying that, I apologize, but there's no other word for it. Nice <laughs> work. There's not another word for it. Malevolent? Oh, malevolent. Oh, that's a kind way to say it. Naomi says I was malevolent. I can't even spell malevolent. But her children can, and they're young. Anyway, so I just wasn't kind. So my point is, I, I told, uh, when I got the revelation, probably five, six, seven years ago, of what a horrible person I was when we got married. I mean, when I got it. And I saw it without anybody pointing it out to me. I was like, oh, my God. And I remember it took me a couple years to have the courage to even tell her because I was so humbled by God revealing to me what a horrible person I was. <laughs> you know, I was humbled by it because he cared so much for me that he would let me see it. And it wasn't condemning. It was kind. And I remember telling her, weeping, weeping, Ooh. weeping, Chelsea, Chelsea. My spiritual daughter, his biological daughter, telling her that I saw what a horrible person I was, and I asked her to please forgive me. And, and she said, Donna, I do forgive you. But this is what she said. She said, Donna, who you were then is who I needed then. Wow. And who you are now is who I need now. Mm -hmm. wow. Who you were then is who I needed then. But who you are now is who I need now. What a gracious way of handling uh, my deep, deep pain yeah. of causing harm 
to these young people that were going to grow and bear the fruit that I poured into them that was not good. Mm -hmm. You see? Because I was seeing the unrighteousness that I poured into them through my legalism, through my legalistic self, through my hatred for myself. You see? I was seeing it. And so I'm not going to say, well, I'm not going to stay in this heavy deep. I'm just, I'm just saying if you're willing to come face to face with you and let God really show you you, let him show you the good, but also let him show you the honorary. <laughs> so you can be free from the honorary and also free from the good because we just want what's from God. Sometimes our good is a substitute, you know? I mean, there, you can be labeled as being good at this and good at that and good at that, and that's who you become. That's just as detrimental as being you were bad at this and you were bad at that and you were bad at this and you were bad at that. They're all labels. Label, if a label defines you, then you, you, you're not seeing who he is on the inside of you. He paid the price for you to know him and be known by him and to enter into what he has for you. You know, which is kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control and love and mercy and joy for you, for you. He wants you to operate from a place where you forgive you. If you'll forgive you, you'll get free of the junk, no matter what it is. And you may not have a lot of junk. I sense a lot of junk in this room, but there's not all junk. And there's some people there just really don't have a lot of junk. There's just a few things. But you'll let God free you of those couple of things. They won't torment you anymore. Come on. It doesn't matter if it's one thing or a thousand things. We're not supposed to be tormented by nothing. And you can't just say, oh, it's the grace and I'm free. But yet you wake up in the middle of the night and you got nightmares. You're not free. There's something tormenting you. There's something harming you and coming after you. And you need to be free from the deep stuff. Does that make sense? Yes. And so self-hatred. So I was, if you, these are signs of self-hatred. You're fearful. You're constantly afraid of punishment and afraid of getting in trouble. Oh, that was my total thing. Oh, my gosh. And I did that as an adult. I was afraid of religious people, that I would do something wrong. Oh, did I do it right? Well, you know what? There were some religious circles that were like, no, you didn't. Because they were all that in a bag of chips, and they didn't let me know that I was under their thumb. Um, unwilling to face the truth. Unable to be wrong. If you feel like you're attacked every single time, you feel condemned every single time when somebody points out something to you, then more than likely you're full with self-hatred. If you are willing to face someone else's criticism of you and disapproval, but you justify your behavior when they point out something, you've probably got some self-hatred. Yes, but do you know what I've been through? Do you know what my day's been like? Who cares? I've got so much going on. If that's coming out of your mouth, you probably got an element of some self-hatred in you because you're justifying poor behavior instead of going, yeah, I screwed up. I apologize. And letting it be and just rock on. Uh, con uh, continually criticizing others to deflect your own weakness. Look, this is just who I am. This is who I've been. I say this. From humility, this is who I've been. Betty, I see you look at me, I'm like, oh God, oh God. It's like my insides want to go, do I meet your approval because I respect you so much? <laughs> you know? But then I'm going, wait, 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 that's that a religion inside of me, need her approval. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> if you're continually complaining about you, your life, and others because your lens is negative and you, all you see are the wrongs in life, then you have not forgiven yourself. Wow. You need to forgive you. <laughs> you need to forgive you. If you are complaining about you and your life and others' lives because your lens is so negative about yourself, mm -hmm. you know, I can't do this right, I can't do that right. I wore that color, but it was the wrong color. I didn't look good yesterday. Mm -hmm. Those shoes hurt me all day long. I knew I shouldn't wear those. That was so stupid. I mean, you know, the, the stuff that girls do, this is the girl stuff. You know, my hair's not, my hair doesn't look right. I tried, but look at that. So you're pointing it out to somebody else. You see, see, see all this blonde here? It's not even the gray it's supposed to be. And you're complaining about yourself. You see what I'm saying? It's very subtle. I'm just keeping it real. It's very subtle. You know, it's like, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you just want to just point out all your wrongs. Then you don't have forgiveness towards yourself. And listen, if you're killing yourself with your words, Amen. it's murder. Yeah. 
when you say negative things about yourself or someone else, you're literally murdering with your tongue. Jesus. You're murdering yourself. Don't murder yourself. God loves us. He has nothing but life. We have a life covenant, not a death covenant. Amen. And we need to switch our attention and, and, and get free from it. And you can't get free. You do not have to live in that junk. Mm. We really don't. And, the, uh, and I remember Pastor Bob years ago, he met with me and he said, I want to, I want to tell you something. And I'm like, I was afraid, like one of the principal's office, what do you want to say? I just wanted to close my eyes. But I had to be an adult. You know, he said, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, but inside you're thinking, oh my God, would I be wrong? And he, and he, God had given him something for me. And he told me that I was full of self-hatred. This is what, like, a lot, many, many years ago, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I am, you know, and that was just, continued to point me, because he could tell I needed freedom, and he could see the calling on my life, he also told me that I needed permission, he said, I, I see three things about you, one is, you are um, full of self-hatred, the other is, you you have a false martyrdom on you, and he said, the third thing is, that you always need permission for everything you do. And he said, I just want you to know that I gave you permission. Amen. Just go do it. Amen. Just go do it. I, 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 he said, I've already seen it, so just go do it. I, I trust you. Go do it. He gave me full permission to just run my race. Two years later, I finally did something with it because I was so afraid to do anything with my life because I was afraid I'd make a mistake because I was so full of self-hatred. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, Self-sabotage, unable to finish what I started. This why this is such a big deal to me. I finished this. This is Craig's biggest pet peeve about me in all of life of 16 years of marriage. Have you finished that yet? Have you done it over again? Isn't this like the hundredth time you've done this over? And finally, he even said, I'm just sick of the 40 days of the brain. He said, I'm sick of the brain to you. <laughs> because he's not sick of the brain to me. But he was sick of hearing about it. He's like, just finish it. <laughs> you know? And he loves me. And he wants me to succeed. But he saw I just kept sabotage, sabotage, sab by doing it over and over and over. Now, this time, I will say, our do-over this time was on purpose and intentional. Because had I finished it five years ago, it would have just been a great big old flop -a -rooney. Not just because it was full of errors and all the editing that needed to be done, but because I didn't know who I was. You know, you try to deliver something and you don't know who you are. It's like an 11-year-old having a physical baby. What are they going to do with that baby? They've got no idea. And it's going to hurt like hell coming out of them. Because they're not ready to have a baby. Their bodies aren't supposed to have a baby at that age. You know? And I've been a baby for a long, long time. Trying to birth adult things that I wasn't ready. And I needed to come into some maturity. You know, and some of you, maybe you are just completely, totally, fully mature. And that's awesome. Uh, but I, I, I know there are some that understand what I'm saying. You have big dreams, and you want to birth some big things. And, and you want, you see it, and you want it. But you're not ready for the responsibility that comes with it. Because you keep avoiding these issues like self-sabotage and self-hatred. And you don't have respect for yourself deep, deep, deep inside where nobody sees. And you still put your skirt on, you get up and go to work, and you get your heels on, you're dressed in tea, you look good, and nobody sees because nobody has a relationship with you. So nobody knows that on the inside, you're like, I, I don't even know how to live my life. And some of you might even have some suicidal thoughts. That's self-hatred. And if that's you, you need to come see me after this meeting. I was like at least two people in here with that. And I need you to come see me after this meeting. You cannot leave. <laughs> because I dealt with suicide. Because it's part of self-hatred. Because you, when you don't love yourself, the enemy comes after you. And it's not just a big old horny dude. It's those thoughts and ideas and those agreements you've made all your life where you've agreed with death. Eventually they all compile and they just create this junk in the bottom of the glass and you're still trying to drink this glass and there's no water in it. You're just used to drinking and it's just full of grossness. It's like, I know you love Cokes, okay? But if all you did was drink Coke every single day for 10 years and you never drank anything else, you would die. Yeah. Because that is death. Right? So it's the same thing. So don't come under condemnation. 
Don't do it. You just come see me. <laughs> uh, you shut down, and you jump from this and this and this and this, like a bee going from flower to flower to flower to flower, flower because you keep avoiding yourself. And you don't want to disappoint anybody by saying no. Oh, I can't help with that. I'm sorry. You, you don't have the courage to say that. So you keep going from flower to flower to flower to flower to flower. But you keep avoiding yourself. You know, women, like, Craig goes to work and he's gone 10 hours and he focuses on that and he comes home and he's done. <laughs> but women, we're like that whole thing. We got that spaghetti going on. And we got a thousand things at one time in our brain, at one time. I mean, I can tell you 50 things right now that are in my brain, right now at this very second. At this very second. Can you? You can't? 50 things, right? Just like that, without even, without that, now I can just talk, start talking. And But I'm still engaged here. And I'm still paying attention. And I still, I see who has suicide. I see who's got the self-hatred. I see everything, but I see all the stuff at one time. I'm like, what is wrong? I see all these bubbles around my head. You know, so, but see, you've got all the bubbles around your head, too. So we're in good company. Big old spaghetti ball. <laughs> you know, let's just not mix the spaghetti, okay? We all got enough issues about mixing our spaghetti. So, uh, also, you, so you shut down relationships with people, and you blame it on them, but it's really due to your own issues. Well, they walked away from me. Well, really? Why did they walk away from you? Oh, so busy. Is there something that um, occurred that you don't want to discuss is why they walked away from you? Or did you walk away from them because you're sick of their shenanigans, but actually your shenanigans were partnering together become, to become bigger shenanigans, and so you decide I'm out? Right. I'm just calling us all. The other thing is uh, feeling double-minded and confused in your direction. Oh, mm. my gosh. These are, this is my life. This is my life story for respect. Mm -hmm. My life. Double-minded. Double-minded. The, the um, oh, my gosh. Where's that scripture? There's a scripture in the Passion Translation. People, you've got to read the Passion, guys. It is freaking awesome. It says, make sure you are, okay, okay, and if anyone belongs to be wise, ask God for wisdom, he will give it to you. He won't see your lack of wisdom as an opportunity to scold you, Thank you Lord. over your failures, Thank you, Father. And, but he will overwhelm your failures with his generous grace. Yes. He's a good God. Just make sure you ask empowered by confident faith without doubting that you will receive. So this is my life. It should say malevolent, but it says for the ambivalent person, the ambivalent person, for the man, benevolent person, uh, believes one minute and doubts the next. Being undecided makes you become like the rough seas driven and tossed by the wind. You're up one minute and tossed down the next. When you are half-hearted and wavering, it leaves you unstable. When you are half-hearted and wavering, if you are half-hearted and wavering the way you think about yourself, you don't like yourself. I know you like yourself. You're amazing. I mean, anyway. If you are half-hearted and, and wavering inside of you, one minute you like you, the next minute you're like, oh, I look like crap. I hate myself. Oh, my gosh. Why did I wear this today? You know, your whole day's confused. You know, one minute you're believing for your kid to come to know God. The next minute you're like, man, they're never going to make it. You're wavering. One minute you think your spouse loves you, the next minute you're like, hey man, don't care about me at all. You're wavering. Right. One minute you think you're, 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 you've got friends, the next minute you're like, I don't have any friends. Well, you had friends yesterday. What happened to that? <laughs> you know, we're, you're wavering. And what happens when you're wavering? You are unstable. Can you really expect to receive anything from the Lord when you're in that condition? Wow. Listen, my entire life has been unstable. That's, uh, it's out of James. Of course it's James. <laughs> yeah, thanks, James. James 1, 2 through 8. The whole thing is amazing. And so I just, I just want to encourage you to just come, come clean. Come clean. The next one is, oh, and double minus confusion is because you feel unworthy and you're afraid to make a mistake. So you're, unwa so you're wavering. So you're unstable. And listen, that's not one minute. This is over years. You can see an instability for like five years. This, this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and then I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, so you don't do anything, so you're unstable. You're unstable. It's because you don't have a good image of yourself. And it's legal to love yourself, people. It's legal to love yourself, ladies. It is legal to love That's you. Good. If you just love everybody around you, you need to love people around you. You can't ditch them just to love you. Now, that's self. But you got to love everybody. 
but you need to include you. Amen. And then, uh, okay, this this was like, oh my gosh, continually criticizing anything or anyone for any reason whatsoever instead of seeing what is good, or you cover their sin. Now listen, I'm not talking about covering sin in someone you have a relationship with and they are in sin. And for you grace people out there watching, oh, there is no sin. Well, maybe not. However, there are some things that are not good for us. And they promote negative things within us. And we do need to stop those things. <laughs> How's that? We're forgiven for the things that we are doing that are habitually wrong. But that doesn't mean we need to keep doing them. Yeah, come on. Why would you continue to murder yourself? Mm. That's just dumb. Mm -hmm. And then Jill says, uh, honor is what love looks like. Well, if you're already all, always rejecting yourself, you're never honoring yourself. Mm -hmm. If you're always hating yourself, you're never respecting yourself. You're never honoring yourself. Does that make sense? And you have to stop and look in the mirror. Where's my mirror? And like yourself. Amen. You have to stop. Now, I'm telling you, I do see this stuff. I see the blonde that's supposed to be gray. I see that I put mascara on. Too. I, mean, I mean, I see all that. <laughs> but if I sit here and criticize myself over it, man, you know what will happen? Is I'll just think about me all day long and how horrible I am. And I'll never give anything to anybody worth anything except for I'm horrible. Look at me how horrible I am. Look at me how horrible I am. When you might be dying in front of me and might just need a hug. Wow. What if somebody just needs a hug and you're just too busy telling them how horrible you are? You see? So those are issues that can be resolved and can be brought out in the open and let go of. You don't just dismiss them and go, I'm done, I'm good. That's not going to help. Ten years later, you're still going to be upset with you. And I'm not talking about hiding in sin. And so, okay. So, how did I get healed? <laughs> You're like, fine, I hear all your negative stuff, but what the hey? <laughs> the process for me really truly has been about forgiving myself. Years ago, um, from the, when I first, first, first entered into a real relationship with God, not a religious one, but a real one, uh, there was a lady who took me under her wing, and her, today is her birthday, so I wish her a happy birthday, even though she's not on Facebook. And um, she taught me how to forgive. And she she showed, she showed saw me through the eyes of, of God, and not one time did I ever feel condemned in her presence. Not one time. Mm -hmm. Now, that's kind of that's tricky, because when you're full of condemnation, you feel condemned usually when anybody says anything to you right. and they call you on the carpet. Mm -hmm. So the condemnation was inside of me. She's the only person I've ever known, except for I think, uh, there's probably three people in my whole life I've ever known that I've not ever felt condemned by. Ever. When I was filled with condemnation. And so, she really taught me how to forgive. She saw me through God's eyes. And she did this whole envision yourself in the cross, envision, envision yourself in him, him in you. She did that with me. And because I was a brand new believer and I could I just literally just had just had eyes to see, I was able to take that in and absorb it. Well, the thing is, I, I came across my family still wasn't changed. My family still hated me. And now I'm, I'm growing in my, now I'm growing in true love, like for me, but more so seeing, coming to grips with the fact that they really don't love me. Before, I ignored it. But when I came to know the Lord, he confronted me with the fact that I wasn't loved. <laughs> and that's for the grace people. They're like, no, that's not what happened. Yes, it is. That's what happened. Because God wanted me to be free from my need for my family to love me. I needed it like I needed water. I needed it because I felt like I couldn't live without it. And part of it was because I missed my mom so much. She was my best friend. She was my closest confidant. She was everything to me. And when she died, my world was over. I mean, all of our worlds were over, honestly, for a long time. But because what died with her was her companionship, her friendship. She loved me unconditionally. 
Today is the 37th year of my mom's passing. And I really felt like the Lord said, today's the day to redeem your respect yes. because you didn't grow up with any. Mm -hmm. You grew up in an environment with no respect for you and no respect for anybody in it. My dad would just come in and his way of the highway. You know, people that are that red personality that dominating, they'll move things that, you know, he would just take over and not ask you anything. So he showed you no respect. Mm -hmm. You know, can, people who control don't show respect. That's not respect. Mm -hmm. That's them only wanting their way. Yeah. And they feel safe if it's their way. And that's a lack of respect. You still have to love those people. But anyway, <laughs> Daddy just really didn't know how to love us. And so we grew up underneath that junk. And so my point is, my mom, uh, today is just a day to redeem. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm redeeming her past too. Mm -hmm. I know she's the reason I'm a writer. That woman would tell me, I mean, I'm a little kid, I want something to play with. Nobody wants to play with me, nobody liked me, I want to beat some worms. I mean, it was a horrible experience. I cried myself to sleep for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. All the kids made fun of me. They called me horrible names. My whole childhood sucked. I'm just telling you, you cannot tell me something that I don't understand. And when she passed, it was like the only person who believed in me was gone. Mm -hmm. The only one, you know? And so today's a day to redeem my need to be validated mm -hmm. by other people, yeah. especially in authority, because my authority, my dad, had none for me. Now, I don't know if that is that's twisted to you or you get it. <coughs> Women get it? Raise your hand if you get it. I see some getting it. And so I just want to encourage you today to enter into a decision. Just make a decision. You know what, God? I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm in. I'm in. I want to love me. I want to respect me. I want to respect other people. I, I, I want to grow in this area. In this area, I'm willing to receive you telling me the truth about me. I don't need to hear the truth about somebody else unless I have a close relationship because we need to share with one another. Don't tell me if somebody tells you something. I remember somebody telling me something years and years ago. I was a brand new believer, and she looked at me, and she sat up here on the stairwell. Don't do this when you're going to criticize somebody. Just don't do this. It was horrible. Anyway, she's sitting up, and I'm sitting down there. <laughs> and, she looks at, and she looks down at me, and she goes, you know what? You're a very harsh woman, and you need to never give anybody a prophetic word ever because you do not need to deliver words of God without love. Now, mind you, I'm a brand new believer, and that wasn't very loving. <laughs> but, but I went home and I asked the Lord, God, what is it about that that's true? Come on. Is there a greater truth in that? Yeah. And it was, he said, you are harsh. And I'm like, Lord, I don't want to be harsh. Would you help me change? Mm -hmm. You know, because he's for us, ladies. Amen. So I just want to encourage you to not be harsh with you, not be harsh with others. And if you are, just stop and go, wait, I'm so sorry I was harsh. Even if it's five weeks later, like, I remember that, and it plays you, and it torments you, go return to that person and look, I just want to ask you to forgive me. I'm clueless. I don't know what I'm doing. I just want to know I love you. <laughs> you know, just be honest. Be honest with you. Be honest with them. And so, uh, okay. And one, one other thing. Uh, I was the submission queen. So submitted to authority that I looked like uh, a robot. But in religious circles, I looked very holy. I looked like um, I was a great leader because I was so submitted to authority. But privately, the reason I was submitted to authority is because I was so fearful of making a mistake. It had nothing to do with submission to authority. And you know, Pastor Bob called me out on that. <laughs> he did one day. I was walking by and I, I said, oh, I, I didn't mean, I, I, I'm, I'm I'm, I'm not trying to be rebellious. He looked at me and he just laughed. I, it, he wasn't mocking me, but it was, it was like one of those things where he was like, he was like saying, I know something about you. You know, and he laughed. He said, no, rebellion is not your issue, Donna. Mm -hmm. And submission is not a problem for you. 
But it's like I knew that he knew something that I needed to know, but he never told me. And now I see it. I was so submitted to authority because I was afraid of making a mistake. Mm -hmm. And so I've taken the last few years since we came to God's house to discover who I am and really come face to face with me and not be religious in my working. So this is big, this is huge for me to even get here and do all this Facebook Live business. I can do Facebook Live for everybody else, and I love my little videos, but this is like disclosing, like being out there and being like raw and naked before humanity. Yeah. And so um, I would encourage you, if you're watching, if you're listening, you know, wh whoever, however, you can be free from the need for other people to approve of you in order for you to go to the bathroom, in order for you to go to another church, in order for you to have children, in order for you to move to another state, in order for you to take another job, you know, those are things, really, you need to take up with God mm -hmm. and not just with the man in the world, in, in the pulpit. Because mm -hmm. if that's your, if that person is so important to you, you can't move without any kind of instruction, mm -hmm. then you don't know who you are. I know, because <laughs> that's who I was. And so I've taken the last probably year and a half, I backed away from uh, everything. I backed away, I didn't want anybody to tell me anything about, I didn't want any prophetic words, I didn't want anybody to tell me anything, I didn't want nothing. I'm like, no, I'm hearing God for myself, leave me alone. I just went to this place, I wanted to hear God for me, for me. I didn't want you to hear God for me. I want to hear God for me. Because I depended on you confirming what I heard from God. Listen, I hear from God. And I heard from God. And I never stopped hearing from God. But I was so addicted to you confirming mm -hmm. that I had heard from God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now listen, if you, if your background has been, I do whatever I want, whenever I want, then this does not apply to you. You need some submission to authority. <laughs> you need it. <laughs> don't be thinking, oh, I don't need this. Yes, you do. You need godly people who hear from God speaking into your life. That's good. You need people that hear God look at you and say, if you marry that person, you're going to be miserable. I remember Pastor Walla telling me years and years ago, he's like, oh, no, it was somebody else. It wasn't him. But someone similar to him. He looked at me and he said, do you want to be barefoot and pregnant on some mountain somewhere? About someone who asked me to marry him. I'm like, huh? No. I said, well, then, there you go. I'm like, oh, okay. wow. I'm like, I was kind of mad. I'm like, aren't you judgmental? He's like, no. I'm like, okay. You know, but they were trying to protect me from marrying somebody that would make me be barefoot and pregnant on some mountain somewhere and then leave my butt and there I'd be. Deprived, alone, poverty stricken. Lack of entitlement, deserving nothing, because that's how I felt. So I attracted somebody who was wow. poverty stricken, deserted, didn't care about themselves, lack of entitlement, and then I would have been barefoot pregnant on some mountain somewhere. You get it? Yeah. Yeah. We all need to be free from that. Yeah. Amen. Now, on the other hand, if you think, oh, I'm all that bag of chips, I'm going to marry me royalty, I got the crown, woo! Then. You can be just as lonely and just as deprived with riches. Because mm -hmm. right. right. money is not going to make you happy either. That's right. It's true. It's about relationship with God. Okay. Anyway, are we good? Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Um, I want to pray for us as a group. And I want to do private prayer. If there's like three different people I want to do private prayer with, but after we're done, I'm going to do that. I'm not going to do that publicly. But... Um, but you know who you are. <laughs> and so, uh, can I pray? Is that good? Yes. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, I thank you for who you are, God. I thank you, Father, uh, for allowing me courage to come and be myself. For allowing me courage to um, speak the truth and love that you've given me in great love. I appreciate it. Father, I just want to encourage every woman here, Father. And God, I just uh, speak peace. And I just want uh, women, I want some of you need to put one hand on your heart. And you may think it's crazy, but put one hand here. One hand on your heart. 
one hand here, and I just want you to just say, peace be still. Peace be still. Peace be still. Peace be still. You know, this place back here where your mind is, you're just saying, peace be still. This place where your hand is, it's where your heart is, saying, peace be still. Peace be still. Peace be still. So I receive peace. 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 Now I feel like God's showing some of you very specific things about your life. I just want you to write them down. Just that specific.